Um, and she'll be talking about the top weight cohomology of AG. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to all of the organizers for putting on this lovely conference. It's so nice to see you all. And I can't wait till next year to hopefully see many of you in person in the Bay Area at this. Um, as said, I'm Juliet Bruce. I'm a new postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley. I am also at MSRI for the year. Before transplanting to the Bay, I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the top weight cohomology of AG, which will tie kind of and touch on many uh, things that were just kind of talked about in the uh, previous talk, which will be nice. And this is all joint work with Madeline Brandt, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Gwen Moreland, and Corey Wolf. Um, but before I get to the math, I think it's important to acknowledge a few things. So first, where I work and live occupies the ancestral and current homeland of the Mukema Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. Black and indigenous lives matter. Further, where I work and live is only a few miles away from the site of Compton's cafeteria, where 51 years ago, in the face of transphobia, police violence, and state violence, one of the first actions in the modern LGBTQ movement uh, occurred led by black, brown, and indigenous trans women of color. Happy Trans Week of Visibility to all those who celebrate. Black and indigenous LGBTQ lives matter. With that all said, let me shift to kind of the math that I want to, to talk about today. And so the central object for the first part of this talk is going to be two sets. So the first set is going to be omega G, which is going to be the set of positive definite G by G real matrices. So I want to think about this as being some subset of the space of all G by G symmetric matrices, right? And so remember a matrix is positive definite if the quadratic form it defines is strictly greater than zero on all non-zero vectors. So you do x, 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 a, x transpose, and that gives you some real number. And if that real number is greater than zero for all non-zero vectors, then we're positive definite. And so this space, omega g, forms a nice convex cone inside the space of all g by g symmetric matrices. Um, but while that it's a nice cone, it's convex, it is definitely not closed. For example, the cone point even, which would correspond to the zero matrix is not positive definite. So we don't even have a cone point in our cone. Um, uh, and so what we want to do is instead consider a partial closure of this space. So what we call omega GRT, which is known as the rational closure of omega G, um, which is the set of positive semi-definite G by G matrices whose kernel is rational. So if I wanted to take this cone and close it up completely, I would get the set of all positive definite G by G matrices, but that's too many things to work with for our interest. Um, so instead we take this partial one where we kind of on the boundary, we throw in a dense set of points uh, and what those points are, are exactly the positive definite matrix, which if I write down their kernel and I write a basis for their kernel, that basis consists of vectors uh, whose coordinates are rational. So this cone is still topologically not in a closed set of the G by G real symmetric matrices, but it's much closer to being closed. For example, doing this throws in the zero matrix. And so we now get a cone point here. Um, which is great. And so this set, the rational closure of omega G will kind of be the star player for our show. And there's an important thing to note, which is that there's a natural action of GLGZ, the group of G by G invertible matrices, naturally acts on omega G RT. And that action is given by given an element Q, we can just send it to AQ a transpose where A is an element of GLGZ. Right? So I'm just saying if I do A, Q, A transpose and the resulting matrix will be positive or positive semi-definite still and the kernel will still be rational as long as I started out with a matrix who was, which was also positive semi-definite and whose kernel was also rational. Um, so this naturally acts on this big cone. It's gonna swirl it around. So let's consider an example. 
has strategically been hidden the entire time. So if G equals two, so we're looking at two by two symmetric matrices, well, that forms an R3 worth of, ma worth of matrices. And the best way to describe a cone in R3, at least via the distance of zoom, is to draw a hyperplane section of the cone. So I take my cone in R3, I cut it with a hyperplane, and what I get is some circle looking thing with a boundary that's not quite all the way filled in. So it's kind of a dense set of points in the boundary and it looks like a circle. What type of points are on, on the boundary? So let me give you a few of them. There's one, zero, 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 one. And then one's on the diagonal, minus one's on the off diagonal. You can check that all of these matrices are going to be positive definite or positive semi-definite with rational kernel, but won't be positive definite. We also get the cone point off in the distance. And you could then also look at the action of GL2Z on these points and see where they start to move around when you let GL2Z act. I, I will tell you already that there is an element of GL, there are elements of GL2Z that will take any one of these two points that will switch any of the two points you want while fixing the third. So somehow under the action of GL2Z, these points are all identified in some ways. And so this cone is lovely. But it has one uh, bad property, which is that it is not polyhedral. And non-polyhedral cones scare me somewhat. Um, just being an algebraic geometer, anything that's not polyhedral, no non-polyhedral cones are things I don't necessarily love in my life. And so what we want to do is find a way to approximate it by rational polyhedral cones. And so the way to do this is with something called the perfect cone decomposition, which I want to think about as being a recipe uh, to produce an infinite collection of rational polyhedral cones, which will approximate the space omega GRT. And so the recipe starts like this. So you input to your recipe one G by G positive definite matrix. And then you take your G by G positive uh, definite matrix, and you look at the set of all integer vectors that are non-zero, which minimize that quadratic form Q. So I say, you take X and you take Q and you say, is X, Q, X transpose as small as possible over all possible integer vectors? Um, so we ask, right, this is essentially, we want that X transpose QX is less than or equal to y transpose qy for all y in z to the g without zero. So I'm just thinking about all of the, in, essentially, right, this quadratic, this positive definite matrix is defining a notion of distance on the lattice. And I'm looking at the vectors of short, integer vectors of shortest length with respect to q. And so this, it turns out, will be some finite set of integer vectors and now I have to take those vectors and tell you how do I get symmetric G by G matrices out of them. Well, if you gave me a vector and I want a symmetric matrix, the easiest thing to do is just to do vector vector transpose to get a G by G symmetric matrix. And that's exactly what we do. So we then construct a cone, which we denote sigma of Q by looking at the cone spanned by the rays X, X transpose, where X is one of these vectors of shortest length. So there's kind of two steps to the recipe. First, you take your quadratic form, your positive definite matrix, you find the vectors of shortest length, you convert those vectors of shortest length to rank one symmetric matrices, and you will look at the cone spanned by these rank one symmetric matrices. And finally, we let sigma of G or sigma PG be the set of all such cones. So for you look at all possible positive definite matrices. So we have one cone for each positive definite matrix. So it's a lot of cones. Um, and this is the perfect cone decomposition. So this set of cones is called the perfect cone decomposition of omega G. We might call the cones that are in it perfect cones. Uh, is it important to saying GLZ instead of GLQ or SLQ? Yes. Um, we want some integral structure to be maintained, essentially, exactly. Um, I think you might be, I think there are other chances you could replace these things with actions of other interesting groups, other interesting modular groups, if you wanted to look at other um, moduli spaces, but I don't think that's here or there for right now. <laughs>
So let's look at what this looks like in an example. So again, g equals two, right? The recipe tells you I have to get, you have to give me a two by two positive definite symmetric matrix. And so I claim that one's on the diagonal, one half's off diagonal is a positive definite matrix. If you do XX transpose, you'll see that it corresponds to the quadratic form X squared, XY, Y squared. And of course, you might check readily now that this polynomial is strictly greater than zero for all non-zero vectors. And so this is the input to my recipe. And the first step in the recipe is to knead out the minimal vector, the vectors of minimal length. So the smallest this polynomial can be on an integer vector is one. And we achieve that minimum value of one at the vectors plus or minus one, zero, plus or minus zero, one, and plus or minus one, minus one. So these are the only vectors, integer vectors you plug in and you'll get the minimum value of one. So there's six vectors. And then for each of these six vectors, I do vector vector transpose to construct a two by two symmetric matrix of rank one. So for example, here, if I do one, zero, I'm going to get the matrix one, zero, zero, zero. Likewise, if I do the vector one minus one, I'm gonna get one minus one minus one, one. And likewise, we'll get this matrix from here. Note the pluses or minuses don't matter. The minus signs will cancel out when you do vector vector transpose. So instead of getting six rays here, I get three. These three symmetric matrices that are positive semi-definite and you can check that they have rational kernels. So I take the cone spanned by these three rays. So in my picture, again, remember this is a three dimensional cone. And so we're gonna look at it by taking a hyperplane section, right? I take these three rays, which I already told you were on the boundary. And then I'm looking at the cone spanned by them, which is exactly this triangle here that's shaded in red and also in gray. So this is one cone in the perfect cone decomposition of omega two RT. You would then have to do this for every other possible two by two positive definite matrix. Um, although it will turn out that if you just start letting GL2Z act on this co cone in gray, you'll see that it starts flipping around in interesting ways and will actually eventually fill up the entire space. So in fact, up to the action of GL2Z, there is exactly one cone of dimension three, namely the gray cone. There is one cone of dimension two, namely whichever face of the gray cone you want to pick. There is one cone of dimension one, whichever ray, pick that one. And of course, there's only one cone of dimension zero, namely the cone point. Okay, so this is some recipe and we see that a priori produces some infinite collection of cones. And the nice thing is that it's a theorem of Voronoi dating back to, in some ways to 1908, that this recipe produces a very nice collection of cones. So the perfect cone decomposition, sigma G upper P constructed as we discussed above has the following nice properties. So first, all the cones are gonna be rational polyhedral cones. Those are a cone on a finite number of rays, and those rays all have rational, can be given by rational vectors. Secondly, this set covers the rational closure of omega G. So if you union all of these perfect cones, you get exactly omega GRT. Secondly, uh, it is has nice properties with respect to these cones. So cones. Uh, the set is closed under taking faces. So if you take a face of a cone in here, it's also in one of a perfect cone. And if you take the intersection of two cones, those cones will intersect along a face and thus also be per a perfect cone. So the set is closed under intersections and taking faces. And finally, we have two properties that say this set of cones, while infinite, plays really well with respect to the action of GLGZ. So first, it's closed under the action of GLGZ. So as you let GLGZ act, these cones might flip around. So this cone might move over here and then over here, but up to the, when you let GLGZ act, the set of such perfect cones is closed. And finally, while there's an infinite number of uh, perfect cones up to the action of GLGZ, there's only a finite number of orbits. Um, and this is really useful because essentially what this is saying is that this perfect cone decomposition is a finite amount of data.
right? In some sense, you specify a finite number of cones, and then you start letting GLGZ act, and it starts just kind of tessellating the picture in some nice way. So really, you're able to approximate this non, this convex non-polyhedral cone uh, by a finite number of cone of rational polyhedral cones up to some complicated but still nice action of GLGZ. I'll note that this that sets of cones that satisfy this property have a special name in the literature. These are known as admissible decompositions, at least in uh, algebraic geometry. And they're very important to kind of the study of compact moduli spaces um, in some ways. Uh, and then you're welcome to ask me more about that later, but I won't say much more. So the last definition I want to give about these cones is to note that we are going to say a cone is alternating if given an element of GLGZ that fixes the cone. So if A sigma A transpose is sigma itself, so it fixes it as a set, then A has to be orientation preserving on sigma. So what do I mean? Well, if A sigma a transpose is sigma. That means A essentially induces a map of topological spaces from sigma to itself. And this map of topological spaces or manifold with boundary or corners or whatever you want to say has to be orientation preserving, right? So it can't somehow take that cone and mirror it or flip it in some weird non-orientation preserving way. So again, Looking at our favorite example for the day, when g equals 2, this was the picture. I said there were exactly three cones of top of each, one cone of each dimension up to the action of GL2z. And if we look, for example, at the gray cone, we'd have to ask, is there an orientation reversing action of GL2z on this cone? And I claim there is. In fact, uh, I'll leave it as an exercise that's not too hard and a little bit fun to show that you can find an element of GL2Z that's going to mirror this entire picture over the red dashed line. So it's going to take this point up here, down here, and going to fix this ray. In particular, it's going to mirror sigma 2. It's also going to mirror this facet, sigma 1. And this mirroring action will exactly tell us that both sigma 2 and sigma 1 are not alternating. On the other hand, the other cones we have are this ray, sigma 0, and the cone point. And while the ray is kind of fixed at the base by the cone point, and what would it mean to mirror a one-dimensional thing? It means you'd have to flip it like this, but your cone point is fixed. So both sigma 0 and sigma uh, minus one are, are alternating. So sigma zero and sigma minus one are alternating. So there are exactly two GL2Z equivalence classes of cones that are alternating in this picture, namely the ray and the cone point. Uh, Juliet. Yes. There's a question in the chat um, about the picture you drew. Is that um, part of just one orbit? Uh, what would a different orbit look like? Um, so thanks for the, raising the question. So this picture I've drawn here, so up to the action, everything is, um, for g equals 2, there's only one orbit in each dimension. So everything is kind of identified. There's only one thing. Um, this is roughly the, the case for small g. So I think for g equals 3, this is also true. In higher dimensions, though, you can get multiple distinct GL GZ orbits, and um, I don't have a good way to picture it, but somehow it's just different cones that can touch, and somehow their faces might get equi be equivalent under the GLGZ action, but the whole cones can get moved around. It turns out to be quite complicated uh, how these things can behave. But thank you so much for the question. Um, so what do I want to do with this? So right. By that theorem of Voronoi, there are a finite number of GLGZ uh, orbits of each cone. And so what I want to do is consider, oh, that was the wrong thing to do. I want to consider the perfect uh, chain complex, which I'm going to call the perfect complex, denoted PG, 
and I'm going to let that be the chain complex, uh, where in de degree k, it's going to be the finite, the, uh, the q, finite dimensional q vector space indexed by the orbits of alternating cones in dimension k plus 1. So I look at all cones of dimension k plus 1. I look up to the action of GLGZ. There's a finite number of those orbits. At each orbit, I take those each orbit and I say, are you alternating? If so, I keep you and I just look at the Q vector space spanned by such cones. And then I put a differential on this in kind of the natural way, namely I take an alternating sum over all co-dimension one faces of my cone. And what should this, what should, how should I determine this minus one sign? Well, there's three answers. One, it's exactly the convention that you need to make this a chain complex. Slightly more accurately, maybe it's the convention you normally use when you're writing a cellular chain complex in topology. Even more accurately, you might say you fix a reference orientation on all representatives of your cones, and you ask whether the, in, re, the reference orientation on the facet agrees with the induced orientation from the larger cone. So there's many different ways to think about the minus sign, but really you just want to have something that forms a chain complex. So this is a complex of finite dimensional Q vector spaces indexed by these perfect cones. Um, and again, we can consider an example here when G equals two, right? I said, there are no alternating perfect cones of dimension three. There are no alternating perfect cones of dimension two. There is one alternating perfect cone of dimension zero of dimension one, namely the ray up here. And there's one alternating perfect cone of dimension zero, namely the cone point. And so this chain complex with G equals two is just zero, zero, Q, Q. And the map is just going to be multiplication by plus or minus one, depending on which you like. Either way, this one map in the chain complex is going to be an isomorphism. And the homology of this chain complex is going to be zero for all K. Um, so the main theorem I want to state today is the following. Um, and it's a theorem, again, of myself, Madeline Brandt, Melody Chen, Margarita Mello, Corey Wolf, and Corey Wolf, which says that for G between 2 and 7, the homology of this complex, PG, that remember we constructed from these perfect cones, is 0, except in the following cases. So when G equals 3, uh, it's non-zero in degree 5. For G equals 5, it's non-zero in degrees 9 and 14. For G equals 6, it's non-zero in degree 11. And G equals 7, it's non-zero in degree 13, 18, 22, and 27. And if you look at these numbers for a hot second, you might think, well, 5, 9, 11, 13, that roughly looks like 2G minus 1. And so you might quest ask the question or conjecture that for G greater than or equal to 5 is the homology in degree 2g minus 1 of this complex non-zero. So that's what we saw here. Um, and I, this question is open for g bigger than 7. But I think it would be really interesting to know the answer to this. Um, in part, it is related I, in some ways to some very interesting connections to things like the moduli space of curves and work of uh, Gladys, Payne, and Chan. It also kind of touches on some interesting connections between these cones, this perfect cone complex, and Kinsevich's graph complex in some ways I won't talk about here. But so this is the main result I want to mention. But in my title, I wasn't talking about this perfect cone complex. I said that was a talk about the top weight cohomology of AG. And the reason for that is the following result due again to myself, Madeline Brandt, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Corey Wolf. And Gwen Moreland, although we recently found out this, you can also deduce such a theorem from Morphe of Okada and Oshita, which says that there exists a canonical isomorphism between the homology of this perfect, of the homology of this perfect cone chain complex that we described above that's entirely combinatorial, right? It comes from cones of G by G symmetric matrices up to some action of G by G invertible matrices, and um, <coughs> this complicated gadget on the right, which is the top weight cohomology of AG. So let me break this down. So AG here is the moduli 
space of abelian varieties of dimension G. And we should think about an abelian, the abelian varieties came up in the previous talk, but if you've never really seen them, uh, you can just think about them as being algebraic varieties that have a natural group structure. Um, so the quintessential example of these things are elliptic curves. So elliptic curves are curves given by the vanishing of a polynomial, but also the points of these elliptic curves magically have a group structure. And so abelian varieties are generalizations of this. You can think about them as being over the complex numbers, at least just being tori. So you can think of them as being some big donuts. Um, and the moduli space of abelian varieties is just some space, a topological space, a variety, a stack, whatever you want to call it, whose points exactly parametrize these things. So you have some topological space, you give me a point in that space, and I can think about that as giving me a, an abelian variety. I'll note that the dimension of this variety is g plus 1 choose 2, which is also going to be d in this equation. So when you see 2d minus k, the d is just the dimension of this space. And then the other thing here, right, is what is this? This is the top weight cohomology. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I have some topological space, so it makes sense to talk about the rational cohomology of it. But we're not going to just talk about all of the rational cohomology, but instead what's called the top weight cohomology, which is essentially just a canonical quotient of this of my cohomology group. All right, so I'm looking at some, there's some way to construct a specific quotient of the normal rational cohomology, and that's what I'm looking at. So I'm looking at a very small piece of the cohomology of AG. Um, if you want to be more precise, what you would say is that the cohomology of AG carries a weight filtration coming from de Ling's theory of weights and mixed Hodge structures, and that weight filtration is supported in degree zero up to 2D, and we're looking at the, the associated graded in degree 2D. Um, and so what's important about this theorem is it exactly translates our previous result about the homology of the perfect cone chain complex into a result about the cohomology of AG, namely the cohomology of AG for G between two and seven is zero except in the following cases. And something I'll, I'll end by noting is that you'll notice here that we get cohomology in degrees 15, 33, and 37, and those are odd numbers. And this in fact answers a question asked by Sam Grzeszewski, namely, is there a, does the moduli space AG have any odd cohomology? And the reason you might ask this question, that seems like an odd one if you've never thought about it, but often when we're working with things over the complex numbers, any cohomology class we can construct geometrically lives in even dimension just because of the fact that it has even real dimension. And so an amazing thing is this kind of combinatorial framework of looking at these perfect cones and this comparison isomorphism gives us a way to get our hands on interesting cohomology classes in algebraic geometry from a very combinatorial perspective that previously we didn't necessarily know. Um, and so I think I'll end by just saying, I think this is the start of a much more rich story. It would be great to be able to construct, for example, an infinite class of cohomology classes for AG, or for example, be able to compute all of the top weight cohomology or the top weight Euler characteristic there are a lot of outstanding questions. And I think this result I've talked about here today is just kind of laying a lot of the groundwork to try to use these interesting combinatorial tools to study a really interesting space in algebraic geometry. And again, thank you so much to the organizers and the audience for listening. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Can I get some real clapping going? <laughs> Cool. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? 